very warm welcome to everyone this evening as we come together to seek the Lord in worship. Let's begin. Let's come before the Lord singing Psalm 14, 1 4. This is Sing Psalms, 14th Psalm, and uh, we can sing the whole psalm from the beginning. This is page 15, Psalm 14. The fool speaks in his heart, there is no God, he says, they are corrupt, their deeds are vile, none walk in godly ways. The Lord looks down from heaven to see the human race, to see if any understand, if any seek God's face. Let's sing the whole psalm, Psalm 14, page 15, and sing psalms. The fool speaks in his heart, there is no God, he says. The fool speaks in his heart. There is no God he sees. They are corrupt, their deeds are wild. None walk in godly. together, call on his name in prayer. Lord, our God, help us as we take up your name this night and come before you with singing and come before you with praying, where we seek to offer to you and to come with, with words and with desires, with thanksgiving and with all our petitions. And we seek to lift our eyes to you tonight as we come so that we may be able to become focused and to have our faith uh, firmly fixed upon you. To be able to, in approaching you just now, be enabled by the Holy Spirit 
that all of us may be conscious of his presence and of that ability to to be still and to know that you are God. Like there in Psalm 46, and you make the promise that there is a river whose streams of which make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High has his abode. God dwells in the midst of her, and she will not be moved. The Lord will be a help to her, and that right early prove. Your promises are so great. And it, if it wasn't for your promises, we dared not ask some of the things we do. But since you've said certain things, glorious things about yourself and the promises that you've made, for the New Testament, Zion, the, the, what the, Paul in Galatians refers to your church as the, as the heavenly Jerusalem, what um, the earthly Jerusalem historically has signified, as there in Revelation we're told, so clearly behold, the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell among them, and he will be their God, and they shall be his people. And for this evening to be conscious of your dwelling here in our midst. We can feel so distant from you so often and and struggle to pray and open the Bible. But it's there that we meet you. It's there that we find you. And there is a sluggishness about us. A twistedness. Can we say that? Where there's a reluctance somewhere, sometimes a hesitation or a distraction. But you have our minds and you have our hearts fixed on you. And there we sung in Psalm 16 in the morning. The psalmist said, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I will not be moved. And to have as he had that assurance of your presence with him. And he did what he had to do and did the right thing by putting you first and setting you as it were ahead of him so that he would be following you and praying for your guidance. It's through that that the blessings come. So, Lord, our God, help us as we come to you tonight to open your word, to sing together and to read part of it and to study together, that you will be pleased, Lord, to bless this time. Few in number, but that makes no difference. And we thank you for that fact that where even two or three meet, you have stated, I am there in the midst. Lord, we don't know what that maybe really could mean. We know something, but we know very little. And it it is your dwelling in our midst that we seek. And And upon every gathering of the church, we pray the same blessing, the overshadowing, presence of the Lord, and for that awareness of heaven meeting earth through the proclamation of the word. Forgive us, Lord, as a generation. We're exactly like those we've sung about in Psalm 14. Every generation is the same. Your word shows us from the beginning, back in Genesis, right through all the Old Testament history and the New Testament histories and the Gospels and the book of Acts. We see fallen humanity bearing its hideous true colors at different times and in different situations. And where we read tonight in Romans chapter 1, we find there a description of the glorious gospel and of the power of the gospel and of the realities of what you have accomplished at the cross, that you provided a righteousness that we could never make for ourselves. In sending your son, he has lived that life of obedience. He came willingly from the council of eternity. And coming into the world, we read in the letter to the Hebrews that he said, A body have you prepared for me, but these words to do thy will. I take delight, thou my God that art. Coming to this world with all that he would meet and endure, he came gladly. We read in Hebrews 11 in the morning that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and is now set down at your right hand. 
And we pray that as we gather as the church, and as the church gathers in all its expressions, few and many, near and far, whatever set of circumstances the church meets in, Lord, that we would worship you this day, and that the Lord's day would be, like Isaiah said, we should be able to call the Sabbath a delight for what it means, for what privileges we have. And it can be difficult. It can bring its problems when we try to do what's right and with family and lots of different things. And for your guidance every step of the way, through Scripture and by the power of the Holy Spirit, through fellowship with one another and through prayer and patient waiting upon your answers, we too wish to do your will. We do everything so imperfectly, but we wish to live in a way that pleases you, that honors you, that magnifies you when no one else is around and no one else sees or knows or hears that we're in our hearts in secret, even in the midst of people, our hearts may be ablaze and almost bursting with adoration and praise. And sometimes, sometimes it's with the tears flowing, the inner reality is seen, where the joy that is inexpressible and full of glory can take such a place. We thank you for that. Particularly praying for people who are struggling, people going through hard times, those we know of, maybe new challenges, and maybe many questions. We pray that you would grant, Lord, to those who we pray for, those who we think of, and those who we otherwise name before you, that you will remember them. And the many we don't maybe think of our name, but there are those here, those in our families who pray. We thank you for ongoing prayer. We believe in the power that you are pleased to show in answer to prayer, not in proportion to our faith or in proportion to our intensity of desire or anything, but as in, uh, in Psalm 65, you tell us, through these inspired words of the psalmist that it's sometimes in awesome, fearful deeds, works of righteousness, that you answer us. And Lord, praise does await you in Zion. There'll be many praises and many reasons for thanksgiving at the end of the day, when things in the present life maybe don't make sense, or maybe they do make sense and they're really difficult to, and burdensome to try and carry and work out in life. That day's coming, when God will wipe away every tear from his people's eyes. And there shall be no more death, or no more sorrow, or suffering, or pain, or sickness. You sum it up uniquely and perfectly as you are perfect. You say there in Revelation that there shall be no more curse. And how that sums everything up, even the beauty of the thistles just now with the background of the amazing green and the grass and seeing the deep colors of what symbolizes the curse. So strange to see such beauty and the evidence of a fallen world and environment when you said to Adam, who was cultivating the ground and who was sent from the garden with Eve to continue that work, that you told him thorns would be, would be growing from there on, symbolizing the judgment well, he said to Adam, cursed is the ground for your sake. And the thorns, the thistles, they showed that very fact. And making agriculture and his life difficult, as he said to him, he'd sweat, he'd, he'd be toiling away in the sweat of his brow, he would eat bread. Until the day he returned to the dust, because you said, dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Lord, we thank you though we can maybe see it with a spectacle, as a spectacle of horror, to see your Son, our Lord, crowned with thorns, and how upon his head the symbolism so satanic and yet so divine, satanic in attempting to inflict pain and humiliation with a mock crown, tearing the skin on his head, and at the same time, we see there symbolized what was actually taking place. That Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law and being made a curse for us. 
and the symbolism of that curse in Eden. What would happen outside of Eden, the curse announced in that place. But there it is symbolized on the crown, the crown of thorns. But it isn't the end, and we thank you for that, that seeing our Lord and what he did, he was doing what he did in our place. That God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, but committing to the church the word of reconciliation. The wonder for us, Lord, is that you didn't leave us and the wonder is that you have provided a way of salvation. That eternally before creation, before the fall, your plan was made perfectly, eternally established. Your counsel endures through every age and generation. And what happens in our lifetime or in any lifetime is exactly what you have planned. We cannot understand how that is the case. We cannot even begin to try to probe into, because you haven't revealed it, how exactly it is that divine sovereignty and human responsibility are perfectly harmonious. But you are God, and we are like nothing. And no matter how great anyone's intellect might be, and we do marvel to see, and to see the gifts you've given of how intelligent some people can be and bright and things like that but that doesn't come into this and it's out of the mouth of children you have ordained your praise and it's those who are as we read in psalm 19 it's you who makes the simple wise and the wisdom you give the knowledge you communicate isn't something that we can learn in the sense of feeling the full force and significance of the teaching as we read in the chapter we're about to turn to, your people are those who are called. It's because a divine work has taken place to summon them with divine power out of darkness into your marvelous light from the power of Satan unto you, the, your power, the power of God. And you have, through that calling, translated your people into the kingdom of your dear Son. And so there is a power and there is a force, a divine dynamic in the gospel that can be so powerful, Lord, that is almost imperceptible to someone who's going through the change, a conversion experience. Yet for the other person, it can be very obvious, black and white, that that same amazing work has to take place. And we thank you, Lord, for doing everything, providing everything to make it so clear to us tonight that our responsibility isn't to understand all of the mysteries. It isn't to learn everything or anything like that. It's to receive that divine teaching, that spiritual illumination, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ with that heavenly light. Like Peter speaking to you once when you were asking them, who do people say that you are? And he said, you are the Christ. The son of the living God. You said to him that flesh and blood hadn't revealed that to him. But your father in heaven. That insight to your amazing identity. When the masses didn't see anything in you. But how blessed their eyes were who saw you. In a spiritual sense. As we read that last Sunday night. Blessed are your eyes. For they see your ears. For they hear. And Lord for eyes to see tonight. And for ears to hear that we would have your teaching and guidance through the teaching that your word gives us. Where there is that, like we read in the first chapter of Thessalonians, Paul acknowledges, he testifies gladly, reminding those in Thessalonica that the reason they became Christians, that they were converted and experienced such a profound change in their lives, was that the word didn't come to them only in word. Because what Paul is saying, we think, in his experience of your dealings, he knew what it was to see the word come only in word. A human communicating the gospel message, the truths, the teachings, the, the words of the word of God. And he also knew the difference when you extended your hand through it, as it were. And when you breathed life into souls and brought them alive. So he knew in Thessalonica, 
as he says there in chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians, that the word didn't come in word only, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with great conviction. And so we are in your hands, Lord. We do get troubled. We see our society, we see our world, we see the churches. We can sometimes uh, maybe become distracted by it if we listen to everything and our, uh, and our minds somewhat tune in to what we're being told. And so often what the, the media pushing their conclusions on us, where all of their researchers and news and all of these things have done all their work to try and gather information and put their own bias and spin and include and exclude details as they please in order for us to believe the story they're telling us. And Lord, we thank you for truth and how precious truth is to your people and that you are the God who is revealed as the one who is the living and the true God. But also you've said that you are the way, the truth, and the life. As the Son of God, as the Son of Man, no one comes to the Father apart from you. And we have this message before us tonight. We pray, Lord, to hear it, to understand it, and to believe it. Remember all who need you tonight, those in their homes. We think, Lord, of those who may have been um, depending somewhat on our live streams and praying for help in sorting these things. And for those, Lord, who were dependent, you will take care and provide, not only in this way on, on the Lord's day, but as we pray as well, that as they read, maybe they can't read, maybe haven't got the mind or the concentration or desire, that you will speak to their hearts, that you, Lord, will revive and strengthen and reinvigorate and where the suffering are still in darkness that you Lord would illuminate them and shine your light into their hearts that the God who created light out of darkness would shine in their hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ sometimes you'd choose not to change our situations maybe for a time anyway if you're going to do this but and throughout scripture we see it and maybe we've seen it in, in others and hopefully in ourselves to a point that we can change when our circumstances maybe won't and rather than think that the situation is final it's for us to see and to discover you in the moment. So grant to, Lord, our people, grant to them. Friends and family, members here in the congregation, and others who belong to us, we pray for them, Lord, throughout our villages, people with no church connection and, and uh, don't want to have that connection. And uh, some who, even faced with their own mortality, as we all are, and knowing, Lord, your, your, your appointment for us may be before anyone else. And it may be, as it has sometimes been the case, it's not people who, who are suffering illness necessarily. That are the, or those we maybe would, not the nice way to say it, but where the, we would expect through illness or age or circumstances, disabilities, whatever it might be. But you, Lord, are the one who you are the one who preserves life. And you are the one who sustains life. And you are the one who gives and you are the one who takes away. And we pray, Lord, that you would grant blessing upon all of our lives, upon our families. And that you, Lord, will remember the villages here and your people who try to bear witness and try to be a light. There is so much darkness. But we pray that you will come and rise like the sun. We have that picture in Malachi, the Old Testament ends. That amazing promise, unto you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. You are our only hope. It's not that we've never believed that, but there are times, and there may be times within a generation where you bring the church 
to face that fact and see it in a completely new light. It's one thing for us, like I suppose in life, where we think before you of what, what's taking place, we can. We need your guidance. We need your illuminate. We need that clarity. And we pray, Lord, for that strength to be reconciled to your will and to rejoice in the Lord always. Remember all who are needing you, where joy is difficult for some, where they're struggling, where, the, where, the, where as some would say, they're waking up. Sometimes their, their thought, their first thought is getting back to sleep. Facing the day can be too hard. Some people are so broken and at an end of themselves, it seems. Sometimes even Christians and other Christians criticize and think it shouldn't be happening or it's unbelief or something. But you are amazing. Your ways are so kind and so gentle, and you know that we're dust. We pray for those who are really struggling and that you will meet with them as only you can. Even the joy we have, Lord, at these times where it becomes, if we understand it right, that people are praying for us, it may be a difficult time, maybe a hard day, things may be, whatever it might be. And then that drawing near of the of the Lord and that freedom to think and pray after a time of bondage. Lord, to be like that, to be praying for each other, carrying one another's burdens, fulfilling the law of Christ, not insisting on or being preoccupied with self, but looking upon everyone's interests, having that Christ-likeness and, Lord, to have that Christ-centeredness. And for your glory, as we read, for the glory of the Lord to be revealed. May it be so. May you build this church. It is yours. And you have said, you said to Peter, and you've said, as it's recorded there in Matthew, it's been said by you through every reading of Scripture to this very day that upon the, the, this rock you said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is you we must trust in. It is to you we must always look. It's upon you we must always depend and especially in those things, especially where we are unable to effect anything. You've said it. We think it so often and we say it. And we know it. That without you, we can do nothing. And so our eyes are upon you. Our, eye, our hands are stretched out to you. And we pray for your blessing as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue singing. We can turn to Psalm 2, the second Psalm. Sing Psalms. Psalm 2. This is page 2 and sing Psalms. We'll sing verses 1 to 7. Verses 1 to 7. In Psalm 2, why do the heathen nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? Earth's kings combine in enmity. Her rulers join against God's reign. Let's sing to verse 7, Psalm 2. From verse 1, why do the heathen nations rage? Why do the heathen nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? Earth's kings combine in enmity. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Turn to the New Testament, letter of the Romans, and chapter 1, Romans 1. Read the whole chapter, Romans 1, and verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you, but I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation to both, uh, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, 
God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And so on. May God bless that reading to us and our meditation on it shortly. We're going to turn first to Psalm 58. Sing Psalms 58. This is on page 75. Sing Psalms. It's on page 75. This is Psalm 58. You rulers, do you know what justice is? Among mankind, do you judge uprightly? No, you devise injustice in your hearts, and on the earth you mete out cruelty. Even from birth the wicked go astray, and from the womb truthfully they speak. Their wayward thoughts well up within their hearts, and havoc with their lying words they wreak. Psalm 58, sing Psalms, page 75. Your rulers... You rulers, do you know what justice is? And 
you found that last singing quite difficult. Some of the Psalms are like that. They're um, called the imprecatory Psalms as one of the old titles where the Psalmists are calling and pleading with God to intervene in a situation where some of the language is very, very expressive of divine intervention and judgment. The picture of the enemy being like a lion and the psalmist praying that God will break the lion's jaw and smash the teeth and all the other things. And even as bad as saying it is one of the, the psalms is at 137, when Zion, no, when, uh, when we remembered um, Zion and when we were hanging our uh, harps on the willow trees, reflecting on what God had done. And reflecting on what had taken place, the psalm ends in praying for God's judgment, including dashing children on rocks. But we can't enter into that. A situation where God's people are so desperately hounded, maligned, and are suffering so terribly. Serious opposition and serious suffering and trials. That they're praying for God to take these people who are causing problems away. Times have been difficult now and again throughout human history. It's good to remember that. It's important to remember that. And while there is something unique about the times that we're living in, and we're living in the last days, and that while there are many things, uh, thankfully, that we can say and maybe observe and even read tonight, things that have happened in the past, there is something that's gone ahead of the times in which we are, like Romans 1 and reading from Verse 18 to the end, especially, it, it's, a, it's a theological, it's a God given explanation of the reason why there is a moral collapse in any society. And the reason is people choose to ignore God. It's not that they don't think He's not there. That's very interesting and important for us. No matter what anyone might say to you, no matter, matter what anyone might even claim. But there is that within every one of us. If we're ever aware of it, it's another thing in the sense of doing something about it. It's often reactionary. When when we think about God, we thought of this in the morning in in passing. When, when, When someone who isn't a Christian is faced to think about God and the cross and think about judgment and think about um, the endlessness of eternity. These these are things that we really don't want to have to think about. There's something offensive about it. There's something very difficult. There's something that when it's revealed to us, we want an alternative explanation. We want our own definition or our own understanding, and we can just go along with our lives without having to think about God. So when the Bible is brought before us, there's, there's an instinctive reaction. It's not that, you know... Uh, this is maybe thinking of people who've, maybe mostly people who've heard the gospel before. Not always. There's, there's some places, like in Athens, where Paul visited and brought the gospel there. He went into the public places and he engaged with the philosophers on Marsh Hill. And some of them wanted to hear. Others were saying, this, what's this fellow talking about? But they came back and, and they heard. But the thing is, that, like we mentioned in the morning, some people are so intellectual, they'll sneer at you. They'll sneer at you. Well, you're one of these Calvinists, are you one of these Bible believers? And you can feel that because you believe these things and the reason you believe in them is not because you decided to just accept them. There's something renovatory and revolutionary has taken place. Isn't that what the chapter's saying to us? I mean, why are we, all of us, not tonight the way the people in chapter 18, uh, sorry, verse 18 and the end of the chapter are described? What's the difference? We always remind ourselves, or should always remind ourselves, sometimes we've got to pull ourselves in at times, to 
to remind ourselves that if it wasn't for God's grace, if it wasn't for God's action or intervention in our lives, and let's say you became a Christian late on in life or came to know the Lord, well, you know this, the same thing's true in the sense that he kept you. And he kept me and my unconverted life and yours and from, from where other people ended up and other people are. And the, the ways you went, the, the straying and the distance, the prodigal son, or the, the son who stayed at home, who was, as he, maybe you maybe argue, he was more lost through his own self-righteousness. The thing for us to, to consider tonight is it's only because of God's work in anyone's life that anyone is different. It's not that they're good enough or they think, I'm going to, you know, you've heard it said, they're, well, they're, they're good living. Well, they're living in a good way, but it's not that they've just decided to clean their lives up. Something profound has happened. Something amazing has taken place. And it, it will take all our Christian lives for us to, and even then we'll only be beginning to gradually appreciate and realize what he's done. It's only in heaven. It's only there with the praise and with the adoration and the worship. Being so informed with minds that are so engaged and so filled with what is necessary by way of knowledge and understanding and awareness to worship like we've never worshipped in all our lives. But tonight, as we think of this first chapter in Romans, the two things, there's a massive contrast, a massive contrast that defines, two, well, everyone in, in two categories. The way Paul describes it, there's the righteous. I don't know if you have the ESV. The chapter divisions, uh, verse 16, is preceded by the small title, the righteous shall live by faith, and then 18, by God's wrath on unrighteousness. There's the righteous and there are the unrighteous. The people who are righteous, we'll see, we'll read a, a bit in chapter two in just a minute. The righteous, not because of their own efforts. It's not their own obedience that's being referred to. Those who are righteous are righteous because they're believing that Christ has lived a perfect life for them. And God has, as it were, it's a legal concept. Paul works it out in Romans. God has imputed or credited to us the perfection of Christ. So it becomes ours. And there's, there's no human analogy, there's no either legal or, or, or any, any way where we can have an illustration. They all, all come short because of the identification and the absolute perfection of this imputation. The, the, he, uh, the Father, made the Son to be sin for us. The sinless, the holy, the harmless, the undefiled, the separate from sinner became the sin bearer. Wasn't his sin. And by carrying sin, we mustn't try and form an idea if that's ever, what, what does this mean? Is it sins multiplied by X number or is it, you know, is, is, is it the burden and, and the weight and the heaviness? And what does it mean to bear someone's sin? Well, what it's referring to is the guilt. The soul that sins will die. And by God imputing, the Father imputing, and the Son receiving gladly the imputation, his standing in the place of us. It is through that that his life for us is perfect. And before God, we're accepted. It's a legal thing. It's not a moral thing. And this is, this is where, if, if, if you're, you know, as it is confusing so often for us, we can overlap the change God does in us with the change God does to us. Something God says about us that connects with what he does in us. What's that meaning? Justification isn't something that happens in us. You don't experience it. It's an act of God's free grace. It's something God does. It's something that happens outside of our self-awareness. What we may become aware of, and maybe not at the time, is faith. It is faith that leads to justification because relinquishing all of our own endeavors and our righteousness and our good deeds and all that, relinquishing it, we embrace Christ alone in his perfection. Have you reached that point? The freedom that comes. You know, Martin Luther, the, one of the great leaders of the Protestant Reformation in Europe, he struggled. He really struggled with this. He tried to make himself good enough and coming under the sense of conviction that he wasn't good enough. You know, he was brought to the discovery of the truths of like, like what we have here at Romans. And he wrote a commentary on Galatians, which also speaks by justification by faith. He discovered through divine illumination, this set the continent of Europe ablaze. This is where the Reformed faith was discovered. The apostolic faith was rediscovered. i have been smothered by darkness for centuries. Let's remember that. Centuries. 
of darkness and ignorance. And then the Protestant Reformation. God is able to do this. Was that the greatest revival the New Testament church has seen? That's a question. And think of its effects. What's so sad so often is a great movement of God can fizzle out. Then someone will say, well, it couldn't have been of God, could it? So how dare we? You know, like someone would even, even try to tell you something and say, well, the Lord has told me to say this. Has he? I don't know that he's told you. I, I, how do you know that he's told you? You know, we've got to listen. We've got to listen to what the Lord is saying and what is, it is written. And to be waiting and seeking that guidance, that illumination. The power of this message is so life-transforming. And it's so powerful and it's so life-transforming that Paul is writing this letter to people he's never met. He's heard of them. He knows of them. They're in Rome. He's not writing like Ephesians to a church he was involved in founding and establishing and he got to know the people. They had great fellowship and so on. This is a church he was wanting to visit. We know he visited later. He ended up in prison, a house arrest. And, um, but this is amazing to think of even that. And the, and the tone, the message, the emphasis of the letter is it's one of his more difficult letters to read they're all peter even says that second peter three that paul says things that are hard to understand and we can wrestle with them and we should because they're so that there's such blessing in them and he's writing to a church that is young you know it's not that there is the sense where it, you know well he we read it in hebrews do we not that there's the, the rebuke was that there was a time and we think of this sometimes there was a time when the christians should have pro pro progressed from milk to meat. And it's like weaning. It's a child coming onto solid food and growing and like really growing and developing and things like that. And in our Christian lives, he says, not only that we should be on the meat, but that we, we should, in a sense, we should be teachers of other people, that we should be growing as Christians. And I'm not saying we're not. You know, we only think of ourselves. And, and by saying that, it's maybe more, more rebuking. It's not saying anything to you at all in this regard but you, you'll know yourself maybe by comparison and to see has, has the Lord been working can you see that and can can you bear witness to what he's doing and to to that divine activity he's writing to them with this amazing verse 16 he said I'm not ashamed of the gospel the context is there from verse 18 and the, the situation you might be faced with the church might be faced with and solutions may be sought as why is this massive declension happening? It's no loss of information or communication. It's not that people aren't hearing. It's not a famine of hearing the word of God. I think chapter 1 in Romans tells us why things happened the way they did at the time to which Paul, uh, of which Paul is writing. He's addressing the Roman Empire. He's speaking about his own time. And speaking about people who in Rome, as these Christians, they would look around and they were maybe part of the old lifestyles themselves. Like in Corinth, a mighty work took place in that city where people's lives were transformed and they had loads of baggage to carry and get sorted out. And the Lord did that and uh, used the ministry of Paul and others to uh, explain the gospel to them and these things, moral issues to all work out. And God was working among these people. We need to remember that. God is sovereign and God deals with and works with people who are messes and who are wrecks. And Christians' lives are, you know, if we, if we, have, we have a look at ourselves before God, a look in the mirror, a look in the Bible, and to discover ourselves and to see ourselves anew, it will humble us so much, won't it? And to have that proper and that right approach and that right attitude to ourselves and to other people. He's not ashamed of the gospel. And what's amazing about that is he is facing a situation that is humanly insurmountable. And so are you and so, are, so am I. We all are as a generation. The declension is in place. Chapter 1, verse 18 to the end, he's talking about it all started. And please think about it. You know, there's some parts in the Bible and we read of them and we almost think of them in isolation. This chapter is telling us what's happening today and it's telling us why it's happening today what's happening today is that people at one point decided not to accept that god is real when did all of that happen you think you go back even and, and some you know that 
you think, you don't want to say that because the history is like that, but there are certain periods in history where changes are, take place, and some of them are, are massive societal changes, sometimes for the better, but mostly for the worse, when the things are anti-God and rebelling against, like we sung in Psalm 2, let's break these shackles and chain, let's just break free, get rid of this whole idea of God, and who's behind all of that? It's Satan. Get rid of him. So have a substitute for origins. And it's just like, oh, here we... But when you think about it, people, although, verse 21, they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. There is a knowledge of God in every human heart. It's part of the image of God that we were created with. The image which is knowledge, there's righteousness, there's holiness, there's dominion over the creatures. And God speaks about how important his image is. That's, that's why capital punishment was um, brought into existence by God himself at the time of, the, of, of, around the time of the flood. Whoever shed the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, because in the image of God made he him. And so men are in God's image. What does that mean? Well, there are these moral and intellectual qualities that not in every respect, the holiness, of course, the righteousness Many of these other aspects have been lost through the fall, but one that remains, although largely distorted, is knowledge. We know God exists. But it is possible, and God may allow us, to go through a phase in our lives where we choose to deny that. And God may say, and this is the reason why all of this has happened, God has allowed people to just go. Remember, and again, Paul deals with this. It's amazing. This book. Every part book of the Bible is amazing. Romans deals with such massive concepts. And Paul isn't scared to reason through and work through things, knowing people aren't going to accept his conclusions. It's not that he doesn't care. It's that he states the truth and says, this is why. This is what's happening. It's up to us to, to do something about that. God's reality can be observed. Creation reveals, he says, verse 20, his eternal power. He existed before time and space and his divine nature. He has to be vast. He has to be glorious. And he has to possess divine perfection to be able to create all of this. He's there. Francis Schaeffer, I don't know if many of you have come across him before. He was a student of Cornelius Van Til, who was along with John Murray and Gresham Machen, some hopefully familiar names that we can remember. But this man, he, he had something of a retreat. Christians, younger Christians sometimes could go to and they would study together. And he wrote a book that God is there. He is there and he is not silent. He is there. God is speaking all the time. Creation is speaking to us. In case that sounds a bit far-fetched, read Psalm 19. Where Psalm 19 tells us there is no speech and there is no language that doesn't understand the language of creation. The sun rising and setting like a young man, strong man to run his race. Creation speaks of God's existence. Providence, the harmony of everything in the universe. And you know, the, the, the scientist will, will verify and quantify, but he'll give a different explanation for it. Then God will let the society go. You don't want me. He gave them what they sought and sent leanness into their souls. It happened with Israel. There were only two who left Egypt who saw and actually stood in Canaan, Joshua and Caleb. The rest died, meaning, meaning not that there were only two who went into Canaan, but it was the generation born in the wilderness journeys. They, with Joshua and Caleb, entered the promised land. The people who left Israel, the people who left Egypt and came into Israel through the wilderness journey, they all but two of them died. Isn't that a thought? Hebrews makes very clear the, the, the reasoning behind it, the theology behind it, the teaching behind it. And the warning comes to us in case we should let these amazing promises slip just like they did. They knew God but didn't honor him as God. But became futile in their thinking. Didn't thank God, didn't honor him, didn't acknowledge him. So become practical atheists. I'm going to put the blinkers on, shut my ears. I'm going to live as though God doesn't exist. Make a God of my, in my own image. Live my life the way I want to. And no one's going to tell me otherwise. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We sung that. The fool, God says, 
The fool says there is no God. They're not using their minds. They're choosing to reject the truth. That's staring them in the face. It's staring all of us in the face. Isn't it something that just crossed my mind? Isn't it something, especially Christians are able to say, you know, we can all, and some people who aren't Christians, and, and you know, this is just a fact of God, how amazing God is, and we can all as men and women appreciate creation and, and different uh, aspects. And sometimes when um, we can make discoveries about certain things, uh, especially when we're, maybe we're converted. Did the grass look greener when you were converted? I mean, people, people say that. Things can look different. They're the same, but you see them with a new light. Grass is green, sky is blue. He's like, I've never seen this before. You start looking at flowers, plants, uh, like you'll notice them. And you look at life, you look at people, you look at everything changes. For the better, and we become aware of things we never knew were real or, or true. We chose to, to stamp on them. But the reason we find our society like this, and the reason you can see as well France, what answer have these people got? What would have been done? That would never, would you think, what, what should be done? What would have been done in the past or with another, another administration? See, this is, this is the time. These are the places. And we're being faced as Christians to actually think, what is happening? Well, we know what's happening. But what is happening? You can see what's going on, but what's actually taking place? It's like a civil war, isn't it? There's no respect. There are no lines, no limits. And it's all excuses, race wars. The police are, well, it's not to justify in any shape or form. And, and the, you know, problems historically and all of these issues with the bias that can corruption that can be among the police. But people, especially when you have people coming from other parts of the world, maybe it's their second, third generation. It doesn't matter. Algerian, Moroccan, as in the case of the, the young boy who was uh, the 17-year-old who was shot driving the car. What are, what is it when you see, and you see the flame, you see people ramming lorries into shops and stealing everything? What's that going to do with it? It's a rebellion against authority. Romans, and again, we've seen Romans so often, but it's, it's towards the end of Romans, we're told the powers that be are ordained by God. There's rebellion, there's anarchy, there's violence. The mayor's house being attacked is one of his children being injured. One of these places. And they're just going crazy, out of control. God has taken restraint away. And you can see that. It's a small picture of something. A big picture, but small relative to the whole world. And the picture, I think, Paul brings before us in, 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 in Romans 1. And the rest of Scripture, particularly there, that in Revelation 20. First, Second Thessalonians, the other parts. Paul's uh, second letter to Timothy describing things spiraling like that as it was in the days of Noah so it will be in the days of the son of man and one of the things we have back in Genesis is that the earth was filled with violence violence and all, all the thoughts of the imagination of people's hearts were only evil continually that is you can you imagine that where men were as close to demons as they could be the restraint is gone and God is saying, I'm it's so serious. It's not I'm going to take this city away like Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, I'm going to destroy the whole world. Everyone but Noah and his family. That's how bad it was. It's going that way. Isn't it? People choose to refuse to accept the knowledge of God. They become futile, verse 21 says, in their thinking. Futile in their thinking. Can you not see it? Some of the agendas and all of the things that are being pushed, they make no sense. They are contradictory. They are, they are factually incorrect. You cannot, you mean, you take it, this, think about what Paul is, is, is saying to the Christians in Rome, and he's giving this explanation with all of the wrong relationships, God gave them up, verse 24, in the lust of their own hearts to impurity. Men with men, women with women. Contrary, wrong. I mean, this is what the Bible is saying. This is just not right. So what, what about our generation? If Paul was alive today, what do you think he would say? Not just people who believe they're the opposite gender. But everything that's taking place, everything that's being pushed, this is the outgrowth of this very thing. 
And you can see, oh, it's always been around and people, you know, it hasn't like this. It hasn't. And we've got to accept that. Self-mutilation. Cutting of self. Changing who God has made us into someone he didn't make or want us to be. It's following a fallen heart that is completely out of touch with God. And where there's a meaning by that, people are behind the agendas. A lot of them know what they're doing. And it's to get the generation that's coming. I don't know if you heard this. Uh, I'm thinking, should I even say this just now? But one of the songs and the chants and the anthems, you've maybe seen it. It was in America just the other day. And they're singing, we're queer, we're here, we're coming for your children. You have a look at it. You, you might wish you didn't see it. But it's a section. It's been on some of the news outlets. That's what they're saying. That's in America. And some, ref, um, you know, Christian, not just Christian, but proper thinking people have taken this up. You can see the responses to that. This is what they're saying. Why are they going into primary schools? Why parades? Have you got a choice? Is it right? Is it wrong? What about the police? What are they doing about this? Establishing law. You see, it's lawless. Doesn't matter in that sense. Law and order, of course. In, this, in these moral areas, they've got no right. Wasting resources and people power, manpower on, on trying to find someone who said something offensive on Twitter and their tweet, even historically. To defend the rights of some people who think they are unique and you know, meaning people who are behind so much, those who are victims of this ideology. It is a religion. We tried to say that in the morning. Verse 20, 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling man, birds, animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up because they chose to resist and refuse and reject him. God left them. And so they chose this way for themselves. Paul calls it shameless. He calls it contrary to nature. Be criminalized for saying that. Does that matter? Are you, are you see, am I, are we ready as Christians to stand? And that isn't just saying, oh, are we ready to stand? We are going to be faced, and you can see it, the wave is like a tsunami that's coming. And it's morally reducing the Western world and our country, reducing us to absolute nothingness. And in terms of what is economic, and political, and with integration between nations, you can keep your eye on Russia and Iran and go further east. And where the West is falling. Now, there's no proponent or supporter of the Russian regime in any shape or form. But this would never be allowed in Russia. Does that make it right or wrong? What's their reason behind it? That does. But this is the thing. What I'm trying to say is where righteousness exalts a nation, sin is a reproach to any people. Look about the leadership. You look in the United States and you can see people just puppets for other people. Other people are doing the, all the decisions. Someone can't even do the talking sometimes. And these are the leaders of the world, leader of the free world. The judgment of God is on us. That's why this is all happening. It's not the end. It might be the beginning. Where does that leave us tonight? It should leave us where Paul was, where he was so infatuated with Christ and with the gospel that he was able to see, and this is where we need to remind ourselves maybe so often, that what is happening isn't because people have the power to do what they're doing. It's not that there's a possibility of them winning in, in one sense, ultimately. But it's to remember the sovereignty of God. And, and please, if you would later, if it's, it's for your faith and mine and our encouragement. Yes, to be, maybe sometimes it's really scary and unnerving to think about what's happening and why it's happening and where, it, where things may go, where the rest of Scripture will point us. But to remember that, as in Romans 1, God gave them up. It's not the people that God couldn't change or, or God couldn't do this. God, and it's his way of dealing with us. And go forward to Romans 9, 10. Paul deals with the objection people have. Saying, how is God just to do that? How is he just in doing that? How is that right? 
What he says, you've got no right to challenge God. That's where faith is fully acquiescing. We, we sung the end of Psalm 58 about how we can rejoice in the Lord's doings and in the Lord bringing justice. He will bring justice. Whatever may come before then, we need to remember it is God bringing his kingdom to pass. This is our time. And this is the day. And we don't know what the Lord might do. We don't know. And even to be concerned as we are about things that are global and international, remember things that are local as well. The news will have you thinking everything's bad. It's not. Things are bad, but everything isn't bad. We have the word of God. You have God. And if you have God, and if, you, and I, if we can get someone to grips with what's happening, then it'll liberate us from so much of the bondage and the oppression. You know, there's some Christians, I know of one, and he, he said, I remember him saying to me, and he, you know, he said he never listens to uh, or puts on the news or reads the news just because of the effect it has on him. But I don't think that's right because, you know, that's like burying your head in the sand. There are alternative media outlets where things that our media will never tell us um, or do their utmost not to tell us, and if they're caught, they'll have to admit it under interrogation. But it's, it's to, be, to be in that place where we are able, in having faith and trust in God, and knowing the power of the gospel, that God is still working, changing lives. But the question of all of this, it's a personal thing, isn't it? What do we think about all of this? Think of your daily life. Think of my daily life. Is God there? Do you even think about him? Do you speak to him? Does he speak to you? Are you aware of him in your life? Why was this previously um, unconverted, religiously fundamentalist terrorist now saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because he had been changed by it? And he knew its power to change even someone like him. So he knew its power in itself. He knew its power in, in his experience. It is the power, the dunamis, not dynamite, like it may be translated. Dynamite will cause explosions and things go everywhere. God's power is a power that puts us back together, isn't it? It doesn't demolish. Maybe there's a breaking in the process and a putting back together as a result. But the power of God is able to change anyone. And if you're worrying about yourself or thinking about yourself or concerned about yourself in any way, remember this. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He wasn't ashamed of the gospel. It was the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. You'll never be good enough to come. So don't bother trying to get yourself better or good enough. Come as you are to him. It makes There's no distinction, he says, between the Jew and the Gentile. There is no difference. It doesn't matter who we are, what we've done. It doesn't matter. None of these distinctions come into this because we are all unrighteous. We are all lost, and we need a Savior to provide a righteousness for us. And he's done that. I'm just going to read that, what he says, and then we'll close. Romans 2. What is it about this righteousness? Why? He says in the gospel, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith. Uh, to faith, you think, well, what's, what's that mean? Well, it, it, when um, he's talking about righteousness, this is chapter 3, not 2, sorry, and verse 21. Let's see what he's saying. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, meaning that this is a righteousness that we don't earn ourselves. It's something done for us. The law and the prophets bear witness to it. Here it is, the righteousness of God, not just that comes from God, but of which God himself is the author. It is a God righteousness. Think of that. He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's wonderful. The righteousness of God, verse 22, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift. We don't earn it. We receive it through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received. And there it is again, by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. 
because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How could God be just and justify the ungodly? The only way was to become their substitute himself. The only way. The only way he could be just and be the justifier, account someone as righteous, the only way is by intervening personally and taking our place himself. It's massive. It's, in, it's incomprehensible in trying to get your head around it. But let's, let's try to see more and have more insight into what this means and to share Paul's enthusiasm. He said, I am not ashamed of the think of it tomorrow. When we meet people and we've got the opportunity, need the wisdom to say it, but it's, it, it's to be, as it were, in that living connection with himself where this overflows into us and we can't keep it to ourselves. Come see a man who told me all that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? Let's pray. Let's pray just now. We do thank you, Lord, for your goodness. How little we appreciate. And there in Romans 1, one of the problems Paul describes is that they didn't choose to think of you or to give thanks. What a thought to be thankless. But Lord, that your people would appreciate and realize that with our own failures to thank you accordingly, we do realize thanksgiving to be a new reality in our lives. And may that be so for us as we consider so much. And even when we can't understand, not even when we wouldn't wish things to be as they are, that we'd learn thanksgiving, that we have reason to praise and thank you, no matter what might be happening. You are sovereign. You are in control. And all things work together for good to those who love you. We thank you for that. Bring us all to that place. And if we've been before, bring us back. We need that reviving constantly. Where we too would feel that surge within us of appreciation and delight. Of glorying in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask in his name for his sake. Amen. Let's turn to Psalm 57. Uh, Scottish Psalter 57, our concluding singing, and this is on page 288, 288, and verses 1 to 5. Be merciful to me, O God. Thy mercy unto me do thou extend, because my soul doth put her trust in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings, my refuge I will place. Until these sad calamities do wholly overpass. Let's sing to verse 5. This is Psalm 57.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.